We usually like to start our show with a lively sort of piece, so you might wonder why our first stop tonight is a cemetery. But if you think about a cemetery not as a lifeless place, but as a repository of life stories, well, now you're talking about a place that's filled with success and failure, love and despair, secrets and scandals. Of course, to get all of that, you're going to need more than just a map of who's buried where. It is a cemetery, but hardly just any cemetery. I mean, people are buried here and their graves are visited by relatives, but Bell Fountain Cemetery in North St. Louis is also a place where you will regularly find groups of people on guided tours. And it draws people from all over seeking out the resting place of a nationally or world famous person. This is the most visited grave, and we'll be getting there in just a moment. We begin at the gatehouse by picking up a map and our guide. Carol Shepley is someone who has a way of bringing this cemetery to life. She was like the Paris Hilton of her day. She had a fling with the second-rate tenor. And She's the author of a book called Movers and Shakers, Scalawags and Suffragettes, Tales from Bell Fountain Cemetery. So I'm thinking a lot of people would just automatically turn to the scallywags and that, I would. that would be my favorite chapter. <laughs> That's, that's Our tour, though, began conventionally, not with a scalawag, but with one of the most important and respected figures in St. Louis and American history. William Clark, of Lewis and Clark fame, explorer and later governor of the Louisiana Territory. This is a real spot of honor in the cemetery. Yes, this is the highest spot, and this is the most visited grave in the cemetery. And, and rightfully so, because the whole West was opened up because of their incredible adventure, how daring they were. His grave was moved here after the cemetery opened in 1849. The obelisk was dedicated in 1904 and rededicated in 2004. But no, no real good dirt on, on Clark, though. Not so much on yeah. Clark. But you've got some on some other people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Clark, it's more that... For a, let's say, more colorful story, you could go to the second most visited grave site. That of beat, and really offbeat writer, William S. Burroughs. So I'm thinking that this is the sort of grave that would attract people like the Jim Morrison grave exactly. in, in Paris. William S. Burroughs, the Naked people. Lunch, and... The big William Burroughs grave is for his grandfather, important in his own right as the inventor of the adding machine. And so the tribute to his genius, when I first saw that, I thought we were talking about the writer, but we're talking about the grandfather. Mm -hmm. So where is he then? He's he is over here. This bench is him. Well, right there. That marks the grave. And it's the American writer. Oh, there it is. Okay. So people will come here. Oh, this is a this pilgrimage is... spot. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. People at the gatehouse say, when they walk in the door, you can tell that they're going to, who they're going to ask for because <laughs> yeah. they're kind of bizarre looking. Another big attraction here is the architectural jewel of Bell Fountain Cemetery, the Wainwright Tomb designed by Lewis Sullivan with help from Frank Lloyd Wright. This is so pretty here. This is sort of Civil War Ridge, that Sterling Price who was... That. Civil War buffs come here for the Union and Confederate generals. A civil rights tour includes the grave of African-American preacher John Meacham. There's Campbell, there's Yateman, you know, Yateman School. Bissell, Bissell yeah. left. You just can't go very far without seeing names you know from local schools, companies, and streets. McPherson, Pendleton, Blow, Beaumont. Or even the name that St. Louis-born poet T.S. Eliot borrowed for the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Sometimes, even if you don't know the names, the mausoleums or the headstones catch your eye, like this one for the riverboat captain, who is also a literary footnote. His name was Isaiah Sellers, and he did some writing and used the pen name Mark Twain before, well, before Mark Twain did. And then there's the Herman Ludy's grave. Well, this, you know, this one just jumps out at you because she seems somewhat inappropriate. Yes, she does. <laughs> she's a, people think, oh, she's an angel, but there are no wings. She has no. kind of a come hither look. What's the story? Okay. There's a story here. He's right? buried you... alone. His wife is on another lot uh -huh. because uh -huh. this... Yeah, something to do with her? Yes. <laughs> 
He he was the president of Ludi's Pharmacal, a homeopathic medicine right. company, and he traveled to Europe quite frequently. And supposedly he fell in love with the sculptor's model, and she refused to marry him. Uh -huh. So he had this beautiful sculpture made and brought it back and had it in the entrance hall of their mansion on Portland Place, but his wife would have no part of it. She's kind of looking down at you, you know, sort of saucy look on her face. Yeah. <laughs> there was nobody who didn't think it was appropriate to be here, except, no. except maybe the, the wife. Yeah, the wife. And she's buried with the children elsewhere. Right. So he's where he wants <laughs> to be, life. which is, yeah. Alone with his girl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> While every grave represents a real life, the cemetery itself actually has a pretty interesting story. It was founded as a non-sectarian burial ground halfway through the 19th century the city of St. Louis was really growing and expanding and there were a lot of little crowded cemeteries in the way. A lot of graves were moved here and now there would be space to handle burials for a long time to come. The Roman Catholics bought up land next door and opened Calvary Cemetery in 1857. These were new kinds of cemeteries, the winding roads, the beautiful setting. It was all intended to make this place a destination for the living. How important was this cemetery in people's lives? It was, Not in their deaths, but in no, their lives. in their lives. It was hugely important. Lovers had trysts here. <laughs> Families would come out every Sunday uh -huh. and visit. And in, in 1849, 1850, when, when Calvary and Bell Fountain uh, were started, there was no Forest Park. No. Oh, no, that was so, 1876. Yeah, so, so this the, was the park for the city, definitely. Carol Shepley is a member of the Bell Fountain Cemetery Board, and that's really how she got to know all of these plots and subplots. Like the story of the beautiful and tragically vain Kate Brewington Bennett. A pale complexion was considered a mark of beauty, and so to be beautiful, she took little do doses of arsenic, and they made her look really pale, which they considered beautiful, and, and then it killed her. So she died only in her 30s, was it 37? Yeah. And she was the most beautiful woman in town. Every obituary always says that. She was the most beautiful woman in town. If they don't say it, then you think, oh, the poor dear. <laughs> right, right. So this is the only spot you've taken me where there's no headstone. Yeah, this but, is, but clearly this is there's a story here, there's, too. <laughs> the, <laughs> fact, the fact that there's no headstone is part of the story. This was the grave of Eliza Haycraft, who was the most successful madam in St. Louis. She had a lot of money, and she knew she was going to die. She had cirrhosis of the liver, and she wanted to be buried in Bell Fountain, where her most prominent clients were buried. <laughs> and, and, but when she brought that request to the cemetery, they said, no. <laughs> and she said, so then she said to the cemetery board members, well, maybe I might have to speak to your wives. So they said, well, all right, <laughs> but, but you can't have a headstone. Really? So that's the story. But there's some interest, I guess, since you brought her to light. Yes. Of, of giving her because a she was not only a, an early businesswoman, but she was incredibly kind and generous. She'd been destitute herself. Oh, she's she's got she's a hooker with a heart of gold. Totally. <laughs> Thousands of people lined the streets of St. Louis for her funeral. Really. She was that beloved. Yes. Yeah. We go from the unmarked grave to the one you just can't miss, and of course that was the idea. This tour group is stopped in front of what might be described as a small cathedral, the resting place of Adolphus Bush, built by his widow Lily Anheuser Bush, who was buried here when she passed away. This actually used to be the site of her parents' tomb. But she thought that it was not grand enough for her prince. So she had it torn down, and her parents were placed outside. She huh. kicked out her parents. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dr. Freud. <laughs> Lily Anheuser spent seven years in what would today be millions of dollars on this monument. So it's only the two of them. And she actually, while she lived, she sent the maids over from her house to clean it twice a week. You'll find members of another famous St. Louis brewing family here, the Lemps, famous now for their tragic suicides and their allegedly haunted mansion in South St. Louis. Yeah. Now I gotta ask you, spending all this time in the cemetery, do you ever get spooked? I mean, <laughs> never, really? Never, never. Somebody said, 
you know, ghosts don't haunt the cemetery. They haunt the place where they're happy or unhappy right. in life. So never. <laughs> so you've never considered this a spooky place? No. Even maybe. I wouldn't like to get stuck in here after dark. Okay. okay so. <laughs> Carol Shepley didn't really do the book all by herself. Others at the cemetery had been researching these lives for decades. But she continued the work, researching and writing, for five years. But the problem with doing something like this is deciding when to stop. <laughs> There's plenty left for volume two, if she so chooses, or even more. About 90 people and families made it into her book. That's out of about a thousand stories she wanted to tell.